Hi, this is Melinda Eshelman from the University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology, and today I'm going to be talking about the pituitary gland as it relates to anesthesia. So starting with the anatomy of the pituitary gland, the pituitary gland is located below the base of the brain within a bony structure called the cella turcica. Um, because of this location within this bony structure, the most commonly used surgical approach is going to be a transphenoidal surgical approach, so basically through the noise through the nose. On the right is a picture of a pituitary tumor. This is actually a fairly large pituitary tumor. It extends above the cella turcica. And so when these tumors start growing, um, the optic chiasm is located just um, above the cella turcica. And so when these tumors start growing, they can compress the optic chiasm. So sometimes your first sign or symptom that you have a problem with your pituitary or a pituitary tumor is going to be um, visual disturbances. The pituitary is divided into the anterior and the posterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary secretes quite a few more hormones than the posterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary is going to secrete your prolactin, your growth hormone, your gonadotropins, which are going to be your luteinizing hormone and your follicle stimulating hormone, as well as TFH and ACTH. Your posterior pituitary is going to secrete um, vasopressin and oxytocin, and that is it. So only vasopressin and oxytocin, and we will get into um, this a little bit later. So the anterior pituitary, again, is responsible for the secretion of six hormones. And this is going to be your prolactin, your growth hormone, your ACTH, your gonadotropin, so your luteinizing hormone and your follicle stimulating hormone, as well as your THA, TSH. Usually, you don't see an isolated deficiency of an anterior pituitary hormone because something that is going to affect one part of the anterior pituitary usually affects the entire um, anterior pituitary. Some early signs that you can see in men, you can see impotence if you have panhypopituitarism, and then in women, you'll see secondary amenorrhea. There are a couple causes of panhypopituitarism. Um, one is going to be Sheehan syndrome, which is when you have um, postpartum hemorrhagic shock, and this leads to necrosis of the anterior pituitary gland. So again, all six of those hormones are not secreted. The second thing that can cause it is you can have destruction of your anterior pituitary due to compression by a tumor. And this is usually an adenoma that compresses this. And so sometimes the adenoma itself may not cause any symptoms, but you have symptoms. So again, like male impotence or secondary amenorrhea if you're a female. And these symptoms are going to be due to the panhypopituitarism, also due to radiation, um, surgical removal, or metastatic tumor. So there's not very many tumors that can metastasize to the pituitary gland. It's most commonly seen with breast or lung cancer, um, and, and those can again con cause panhypopituitarism. The treatment for this is going to be um, replacement of all of the specific hormones, and, and these should be continued in the perioperative uh, period. And if the patient is on steroids as a part of panhypopituitarism, um, the, these steroids, the patient should need a should receive a stress dose steroid during the perioperative period because of the inadequate ACTH and the patient is unable to um, release these steroids themselves. So again, continue all of these hormone replacements within the perioperative period, and then if they are on steroids, they will need a stress dose steroid. So hypersecretion uh, from the anterior pituitary, this is usually caused by an adenoma, um, and the signs and symptoms that you'll see will really depend on what hormone is being secreted. If it's ACTH that's being secreted, you're going to see a Cushing syndrome. Um, if it's prolactin that's being secreted, you'll see galactorrhea. And if it's growth hormone that's being secreted, you'll see gigantism or acromegaly. Um, so the, so the, some of the signs and symptoms um, that aren't specific to the hormone are, can be due to uh, extension, paracellar extension of the adenoma. If it extends so much, it can um, block the, the flow of the CSF, and so you can have an increased ICP with headache and papilledema. If the optic nerve is being compressed, you'll have, uh, you can have visual field disturbances. And so really it's just that these are anatomical signs and symptoms based on where the tumor is located and what it's compressing. So a note on acromegaly, this is going to be due to hypersecretion of growth hormone. On the right, you can see a woman. Um, those pictures were actually taken 11 years apart. So on the right is the first picture, and then she developed acromegaly, so uh, excess secretion of growth hormone. And you can see the hypertrophy of her soft tissue, the distortion of her bony prominences. Um, so you see it's pretty, pretty significant in 11 years, the changes that happened. So with acromegaly, you see hypertrophy of skeletal, connective, and soft tissues. 
This can lead to quite a few problems as far as um, anesthesia goes. First of all, you can have an enlarged tongue and epiglottis, and this can lead to airway obstruction or difficult mass ventilation. And 20 to 30 percent actually have difficult uh, intubations, and it's kind of unpredictable based on looking at the patient whether or not their airway is going to be difficult. They can have subglottic narrowing due to, again, hypertrophy of the tissue. Um, then they can have <clears throat> As the tissue continues to hypertrophy, um, nerves can be uh, stretched, and so you can have stretching of the recurrent laryngeal nerves. So this can lead to vocal cord uh, paralysis, hopefully unilateral, because bilateral would be a problem. And this can lead to hoarseness. Um, you can also have, in addition to like the recurrent laryngeal nerve, you can have peripheral nerve or artery entrapment. And acromegaly is also has an association with hypertension and diabetes. Um, so these patients, again, can be a pretty difficult airway. It can come from a different couple different things. They can be difficult to pre just because, again, the abnormality of the face and the different structures. So it can be difficult to get a seal. So if it's difficult to pre it may also be difficult to mask for this reason because, again, you might not be able to get a seal. And then due to the hypertrophy of so much tissue, it might be difficult um, to get down to the to the vocal cords and the enlarged tongue and epiglottis can make it difficult to mass ventilate. Um, so again, 20 to 30 percent of these patients have difficult intubations, and it, it's not predictable which which patients are going to have a difficult airway. The posterior pituitary, although it's very close to the anterior pituitary, it's very it's a very different structure. It's actually composed of terminal neuron endings that start in the hypothalamus and then end in the posterior pituitary. Um, there are two things that are secreted by the posterior pituitary. It's going to be your vasopressin or ADH and your oxytocin. And again, these are th synthesized in the hypothalamus and then travel down along that neuron and are stored within vesicles in the posterior pituitary. So vasopressin, um, the role of vasopressin is uh, a fewfold, twofold at least. Um, one is maintenance of extracellular fluid volume and, and secondary is regulation of plasma osmolality. And so it's actually osmoreceptors within the hypothalamus when they sense uh, osmolality that is too high, they will release vasopressin, and then vasopressin will result in retention of fluid and increase your extracellular fluid volume, and increasing the extracellular fluid volume will then decrease your plasma osmolality. Oxytocin is um, the second thing that's released by the posterior pituitary, and the primary function of oxytocin um, are twofold. One, contraction of the uterus, and then two, it also promotes milk secretion and, and ejection by the mammary glands. So a little bit more about vasopressin. Again, the release of vasopressin happens as a result of an increase in osmolality. So the vasopressin is synthesized in the hypothalamus and stored within the posterior pituitary, and then the hypothalamus secretes um, senses an increase in the osmolality, and this is fairly sensitive. It can increase, it can sense an increase in the osmolality by as little as 1%. Um, so it senses this increase in osmolality and then releases vasopressin. So then what happens? So the vasopressin uh, works at the collecting tubules of the kidney. There are other sites of action, but as far as increasing the plasma osmolality, it works at the collecting tubules of the kidney. It promotes resorption of solute-free water by increasing the permeability to water alone. So you're going to have an increase in the amount of water that's resorbed, but not going to resorb any other solutes. And so this is going to result in a decrease in your plasma osmolality. It's also going to re result in an increase in your circulating volume. Vasopressin can also be released um, by or stimulate this the, the release of vasopressin can be stimulated by stretch receptors in the left atrium. When these stretch receptors sense a decrease in volume, um, they may release vasopressin. And so even if your osmolality is appropriate, if the these stretch receptors in the left atrium sense a decrease in volume, vasopressin will be released. And again, this is going to be to increase the amount of free water that is resorbed and so to expand your plasma volume. There are a few other things that can also um, lead to the uh, release of, of vasopressin or stimulate the release of vasopressin, um, including positive pressure ventilation of the lungs, stress, anxiety, hyperthermia, um, beta adrenergic stimulation, or anything that releases a histamine. And so if you think about this, you know, stress, anxiety, hyperthermia, um, beta stimulation, these are things that may uh, at least the hyperthermia and the, the beta stimulation may indicate an illness of some sort, you know, a histamine releasing stimulus. If you have a lot of histamine, you could you could see that your body would want to expand the plasma volume um, just to make sure that you don't have any episodes of hypertension. So all of these things can also lead to a release of vasopressin.
therefore stimulate the release of vasopressin. Vasopressin also acts at vascular smooth muscle to increase blood vessel, so it causes constriction of vascular smooth muscle, specifically um, in the splanchnic, renal, and coronary beds. So sometimes it can be used in patients with esophageal varices to help um, constrict uh, the, the arteries leading to, to that, that may feed into these um, esophageal varices, and so they may be able to help the esophageal varices in that way. However, you have to be careful in patients that have coronary disease because, again, vasopressin um, causes the constriction of coronaries, and so it may lead to coronary, isch coronary ischemia. Vasopressin also promotes hemostasis, and this is through an increase in circulating level of von factor and factor eight. Um, and um, I don't know if I definitely use desmopressin, um, DDAVP. It's an analog of ADH. It doesn't have the same um, effects on vascular smooth muscle, but it can also be used to treat some types of von Willebrand disease and also can be used to treat um, fle bleeding or coagulopathy, especially in patients with renal failure. So uremic coagulopathy can also be treated with um, DDAVP in addition to um, von Willebrand's disease. Diabetes insipidus. So diabetes insipidus occurs when the secretion or action of vasopressin is decreased by 80 to 85 percent. It's broken into neurogenic and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So neurogenic diabetes insipidus means there is a decreased synthesis or release of vasopressin. So it's not that the vasopressin does not work. It's just that the hypothalamus is not making it or the posterior pituitary is not releasing it. This is in comparison to nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, where the hypothalamus is making the, the vasopressin and the posterior pituitary is releasing it, but the renal tubules do not recognize and do not respond appropriately. So the vasopressin is present, but there is a resistance or insensitivity to vasopressin at the level of the renal tubules. This results in um, polydipsia, hypernatremia, and a high output of very poorly concentrated urine. So this is a patient that is constantly thirsty, constantly trying to drink a lot of water, and despite this fact, um, can not reabsorb any of this water, so they end up with hypernatremia and a very volume depleted, and they just, again, all of this water remains in the urine. They cannot resorb it, so they have this high output of very poorly concentrated urine. They can present an altered mental status. They can present with seizures, fatigue, weakness, and hemodynamic instability, and it can actually be life-threatening because of the degree of hypovolemia and because of the hypernatremia. To diagnose someone with diabetes insipidus, the 24-hour urine volume needs to be greater than 50 mLs per kilo, and then the urine osmolality is less than 300 milliosmoles per liter. So again, this is someone that is urinating a lot, um, but it's a lot of very dilute urine, and they're also having, you know, because of this, either lack of action of vasopressin or lack of release or synthesis of vasopressin, they're unable to resorb all this water, and so they are creating all of this very, um, very, very dilute urine. So neurogenic diabetes insipidus, again, this is going to be a problem with either not making enough vasopressin or not secreting enough vasopressin. This is going to occur after destruction of the pituitary gland. This can be due to intracranial trauma or infiltrating lost lesions. This can also occur um, during surgery, specifically pituitary surgery. So actually in about 18 to 30 percent of cases um, of pituitary surgeries, the patients go on to develop neurogenic diabetes insipidus. This usually occurs within 24 hours. It doesn't always happen in the OR, but it does usually happen within the first 24 hours. I remember I had this one pituitary case during residency, and I looked down and there was like two and a half liters in the Foley bag, and I thought the bag was going to explode. Um, the patient had developed neurogenic diabetes insipidus, and sure enough, it had been a pituitary case, so just something to look out for when you are doing, if you are doing pituitary surgery. Again, it doesn't always develop intraoperatively, but does occur within the first 24 hours, and it actually tends to resolve. So within about, uh, it may only last a few days, but it may last up to six months then it usually does resolve if it's due to surgery of the pituitary. If neurogenic diabetes insipidus develops secondary to severe head trauma or subarachnoid hemorrhage, these patients often have impending brain death, and it's a poor prognostic factor. Um, so the treatment of neurogenic diabetes insipidus is going to be give them what they aren't making or aren't secreting themselves. So give them desmopressin or DDAVP, which is an analog of vasopressin. Give them vasopressin, or, and then also give them, because they've um, lost a lot of volume, give them an isotonic crystalloid solution. If you're having problems with blood pressure, it makes sense to give vasopressin. If you're hemodynamically stable, um, you can absolutely give DDAVP. You do have to be a little careful with DDAVP if you give it too quickly. Uh, it can cause some hypotension, so just something to be aware of. So again, um, these patients, you're just going to give them what they cannot make and what they aren't making, which is DDAVP and or vasopressin, and then an isotonic crystalloid solution, and be on the lookout for this during pituitary surgery.
just for the sake of completeness, I'm going to mention nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, although um, this is not something that will develop acutely in the operating room. This is something that perhaps your patients might have if they come in as an outpatient. So the difference between this and neurogenic diabetes insipidus is that this has a minimal response to DBABP. There can be a little bit of a response, but not much of a response. So the treatment in this is going to be a low salt, low protein diet. And so the idea behind this is that the urine output is pretty much completely dependent on the osmolality, um, so the, the delivery of solute to the kidney. So if you decrease the amount of solute that's delivered to the kidney by having less salt and less protein, um, there's the concentration of your urine will, um, you will excrete less, you will keep more water in because the concentration of your urine will be low because you are just not delivering that solute to the kidneys. Um, diuretics can also be used, specifically thiazides. This is a little bit counterintuitive, but what it does is thiazides act proximal to where ADH acts, and so you induce a mild volume depletion, which increases the reabsorption of uh, sodium and water, and then you have less water load that is delivered to the collecting ducts, which is where the ADH acts. Additionally, NSAIDs, and so NSAIDs inhibit renal prostaglandin synthesis, and then renal prostaglandins um, antagonize the action of ADH. Um, so then you can uh, in, uh, decrease your urine output in this way. But again, this, these are, you know, these patients, this isn't something that's going to develop acutely in the operating room. These are patients that might come in as an outpatient. As far as the anesthetic management in a patient with diabetes insipidus, first, I think if you're doing any pituitary case, you have, a ha have to have a high index of suspicion, or if you're doing any intracranial case or your patient has had uh, trauma, consider that this patient might develop diabetes insipidus. Um, you should have continuous monitoring of urine output, uh, measure the, the serum sodium and osmolality with some regularity. Um, if they have a complete lack of ADH and are unable to secrete any ADH, so they have uh, neurogenic diabetes insipidus, it's prudent to give preoperative desmopressin. And then isotonic fluids should be used for resuscitation unless the patient's uh, plasma osmolality starts to increase, in which you can consider a hypotonic fluid, but um, definitely start with isotonic fluids. So SIADH, the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. So this is pretty much exactly the opposite of what we were just talking about. So diabetes insipidus is going to be when you're not secreting any, any antidiuretic hormone, and so you're unable to reabsorb any water, and so you have a intravascular volume depletion, and you have an increased plasma osmolality and hypernatremia. So when you have too much vasopressin, you're going to have the opposite things happen. So you're going to have hyponatremia due to the reabsorption of all of this water. You're going to have expansion of the intravascular fluid volume. You're going to have um, fluid overload. There's a couple different things that can cause SIADH. One that we think of most frequently is going to be production of vasopressin by tumors, specifically small cell lung carcinoma. So about 50% of patients that are diagnosed with small cell lung carcinoma do develop SIADH, um, and carcinotumor can also present. Uh, uh, result in SADH, but a lot of times, like I said, we think of small cell lung carcinoma. Other things that can lead to SADH are going to be um, trauma, infections, certain medications, including chlorpropamide, clofibrate, and thiazide, as well as a few anti-neoplastic agents. And then hypothyroidism can actually lead to SIADH. Um, there are other things, but um, again, the one we most Frequently think of is going to be a perineoplastic syndrome with small cell lung carcinoma, which 50% of these patients do develop SIADH. So the signs and symptoms of SIADH are due to the dilutional hyponatremia that occurs, as well as the low serum osmolality and the decreased urine output. Um, some of the things that you can see are nausea, weakness, lethargy, confusion, depressed mental status, seizures, and weight gains. Rarely you see peripheral edema and hypertension because of volume status. Um, this is not seen that commonly, but can occasionally be seen. Um, the degree of your symptoms and the presence of your symptoms are really related to how quickly you, de you develop the hyponatremia and how severe the hyponatremia is. So if you develop this low sodium over several weeks, it's possible that you won't have any symptoms at all. But if you develop it rather rapidly or have a very severe, severely low sodium, um, you can expect to see more of these symptoms and, and more severe symptoms.
This is really a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to rule out all the other causes of hyponatremia before you decide that um, this is the cause. What you'll see is a sodium less than 130, um, a low serum osmolality. And again, this is because you have too much ADH and you are retaining all of that water. And so you're going to have a decreased serum osmolality. You have um, a normal or an increased urinary sodium. You would not expect this in someone that is volume overloaded. Um, and so they would have a, a, a normal or an increased uh, urinary excretion of sodium. And then you would have an inappropriately normal or increased urine osmolality. So your urine is going to be um, more hypertonic, so it's going to have more solute in it in comparison to your plasma. And you would not expect this for someone that, again, is volume overloaded and needs to get rid of some of the fluid. So, again, that's why it's inappropriate ADH secretion. So you would have, um, you know, a plasma osmolality that is lower than your urine osmolality, which is not what you would expect. As far as the treatment of SADH, the mainstay, the first treatment that's going to happen is going to be fluid restriction, somewhere between 500 and 500 cc's and one liter per day, less than that, because if you are taking in less fluid, there will be less fluid for you to reabsorb, and this will also result in a slow correction of your sodium. If the sodium is very low and you're having some symptoms, some, um, you know, lethargy, some altered mental status, you can consider hypertonic saline and also Lasix. But again, just very careful in the rate of correction of the hyponatremia. Um, we all know of the dreaded consequence of central pontine myelinolysis, and we definitely want to avoid that. So just be very cautious the rate at which you are correcting the sodium. Um, there are a few medications that can also be given, demeclocycline, which acts at the renal distal tubule and it inhibits the action of antidiuretic hormone. So if you are inhibiting the action of your antidiuretic hormone, you are going to allow more water to pass into the urine and you're um, going to be able to maintain a normal osmolality. Conavaptan is a vasopressin 2 receptor antagonist, and so this is going to obviously antagonize at the vasopressin 2 receptor. And so if you have an antagonist there, um, it's going to block the action of the uh, vasopressin. And so, again, you will have um, less water that is reabsorbed. As far as the anesthetic management, um, it's going to focus on um, fluids and electrolytes and making sure you're giving an appropriate but not too many fluids and monitoring the electrolytes. Keeping in mind that if these patients have cancer, if it's a perineal plastic syndrome, anemia and or malnutrition may be present. If you do develop some sort of electrolyte abnormality, this might lead to delayed awakening. Um, and, and again, it's important to frequently measure the plasma osmolality as well as the serum osmolality, especially if you are working on correcting the sodium or if the sodium is changing, because again, you want to be really sure that you are not correcting that sodium too quickly. These are my references, primarily the textbooks I used, um, Barish, Stoltings, and then Miller's Anesthesia as well. Thanks for listening.